This is my mobile home lab, or is it my mobile home lab, or just mobile lab, or travel router plus plus, or the ultimate mobile home lab? Anyway, it's a computer that I bring with me that serves as a network firewall, an access point, and a platform to run apps, services, and virtual machines. I guess it's a cross between Wendell's Forbidden Router and Network Chuck's Travel Router. It's something that I'm going to take with me every time I travel and will provide internet access, whether that be from an existing network or one I connect to over my carrier's mobile data network. This is something that I've wanted to create for quite some time because when traveling, I bring a few pieces of technology with me to make my life a little bit easier and to keep my nerd brain fed. I've always carried this old Linksys Cisco router with me every time I travel, and it provides a secure private network that only my devices can connect to. I can even take it one step further and use a VPN to connect all of my devices securely to my home network, where I get the same protection that I do as if I'm physically at home. This little router has worked great for quite some time, but I also started bringing a Raspberry Pi to provide a few more services on my local network. That's around the time when I started thinking about how to combine all this functionality into one package. Protectly heard what I was doing and reached out to me and said they wanted me to take a device with me on my next road trip and see if this combination of form factor and hardware would accomplish everything I needed out of my new mobile home lab forbidden travel router plus plus ultimate home lab thingy. <laughs> this is a Protectly Vault VP2420, which if you couldn't tell by the huge heatsink on the top, it's fanless and silent. This model has an Intel Celeron J4612, but it's not like the Celerons of the past. This Celeron has four cores and four threads and has a base clock speed of 2 GHz and can burst up to 2.6 GHz. What makes this CPU great is that it's super low power but still has features like AES-NI and VTX and VTD which makes this great for a hypervisor like VMware or Proxmox. This model comes with four 2.5 gigabit Ethernet ports for lots of hardwired connectivity options. But even more interesting than the hardwired options are the wireless options. You probably noticed all of the antennas sticking out. Now, one set is pretty obvious, and that's for Wi-Fi. It's Protectly's Wi-Fi module that supports 802.11 AC BGN and fits into the M.2 slot. The other antennas are actually for a 4G LTE modem that works with most carriers. It even has a slot on the outside of the case that you can insert your SIM card into without opening up the device at all. As far as storage goes, it has an internal 8GB EMMC module that I won't really be using, so I opted for a 1TB Samsung SSD. I would like to have another option for another drive, but I figured this was good enough for what I was going to use it for. As far as I.O. goes, we have an HDMI port, two USB 3.0 ports, a display port, USB-C, and a micro USB for console access. It's powered by this little brick that has a barrel plug for power. This is quite the capable machine for something that's smaller than a tablet. All in all, it's a solid, fanless, quiet, yet powerful build. So now that I put this all together, <laughs> It came pre-assembled. How was I going to build the ultimate mobile home lab? My original thought was just to run PFSense or OpenSense on this machine and use it as a router. However, FreeBSD, the operating system that these are built on top of, don't have drivers for this wireless NIC, or most wireless NICs. That shut this down really quick. Then I noticed that Protectly have documentation on their site on how to set this device up with OpenWRT. That's when I remembered Network Chuck's video and decided that if he got it going, I could too. <laughs> well, not really because he's like a legit networking person and I'm just a hack, <laughs> seriously. But I thought I'd give it a shot. So I installed OpenWRT. After getting it running, I quickly realized I should have just used a hypervisor and created an OpenWRT virtual machine. This would allow me to make changes and back them up as I go. It would also allow me to install other virtual machines and containers that I can use while on the go. So that's what I did. I installed Proxmox on this machine since it supports virtualization and hardware pass-through. I found this great guide on creating an OpenWRT VM on Proxmox and I will have a link in my documentation and you can find that link in the description below. The steps to create a VM were pretty straightforward. I followed each step on the checklist carefully. Once I had the virtual machine configured, I then passed through the devices that I need to run the router along with an access point. I passed through a NIC for WAN access, the wireless adapter for an access point, and a USB NIC for additional WAN access, and 
The USB modem for, well, WAN access for LTE. I gave it two gigabytes of RAM and two CPU cores and a disk of only 512 megabytes. Now that might not seem like much, but it's more than I will ever need considering this router that also runs a version of OpenWRT only uses 32 megabytes of RAM and eight megabytes of disk space. Once the machine was up and running, I made some changes to the NIC and then went to the OpenWRT admin interface. The interface is pretty basic, although it does come with dark mode, so that's a plus for me. They also support a few different themes, however, I decided to stick with the default bootstrap dark. I configured a few initial settings like NTP, my router's name, and then headed over to the software section. Here I can install some additional packages. I installed a few optional packages like Nano, ZSH, USB utils, and HTOP for better monitoring. After doing this, it was now time to configure the network. First, I wanted to be sure I could connect to this device via LAN. This was as simple as just configuring the virtual machine to connect to the bridge on Proxmox. This means when I plug in an Ethernet cable to a port dedicated as LAN, I can connect to anything running on the Proxmox bridge. This will be the local area network for all of my devices connected on this subnet. If you want, you can configure a DHCP server on this OpenWRT interface, but I'm going to do that later with Pi-hole or even PFSense later on. The next NIC that I wanted to configure was the WAN NIC. This will be the NIC that is passed through to this virtual machine and give it internet access if you have physical access to the modem or an upstream switch. It's as simple as assigning this NIC to WAN and turning on DHCP. Physically plugging in an ethernet cable is my preferred method of connecting this router to an upstream network like an Airbnb's modem or any other network you don't trust. Now that I have the LAN and the WAN NICs configured, I can plug in my laptop and connect to this network. This works fine, but really we want to broadcast our own wireless SSID so that all of our devices can connect to it. This is where we'll need to configure our Protectly wireless NIC. In order for this NIC to work, we'll need to install the drivers and a few packages from OpenWRT to enable the wireless access point feature, and we can do this in the software section. You'll need to install a few packages and then overwrite a few files with ones from Protectly. They found that some of the packages that are available in OpenWRT aren't compatible, so they provided these files on their website along with instructions. Once that's taken care of, we can reboot, and now we can see the wireless section with our wireless NIC. Here we'll want to configure the wireless network we want to broadcast for our clients to connect to. You'll need to configure the SSID, security, and wireless mode. Pro tip, I found out that even though this is a dual band wireless NIC, you can't broadcast on both bands at the same time. So if you aren't going to connect any 2.4 gigahertz devices, you're fine. You can set it to AC mode or N 5 gigahertz. But if you are going to use any 2.4 gigahertz devices, you'll need to set the mode to the lowest common denominator of 2.4 gigahertz. This is so all devices can connect. Another thing you can do is configure a second NIC to broadcast on 2.4 gigahertz but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Once you apply this, you should be able to see your new SSID and connect to OpenWRT. And if you have the WAN port connected to an upstream network, you should be able to use this as your router. But the fun doesn't stop there, no, <laughs> not even close. At this point, you should be able to connect to your router and use the internet from the WAN port, but what if you don't have access to the WAN port? This is where a second wireless network device comes into play. Now, let me be clear, this was the most complicated part of the whole project. I tested eight USB wireless network adapters before I finally found one that worked with OpenWRT. I tested name brands, no name brands, USB 2, USB 3, ones with odd antennas, and ones without external antennas at all. It turns out that most wireless USB adapters have a Realtek chipset, and that doesn't play well with OpenWRT. It was actually really hard to find one without a Realtek chip, but it turns out this tiny little no-name one works great, and that's because it's based on the Rodlink chipset, one that's very hard to find. I'll have links below if you're interested. So, again, you'll need to install a few packages for driver support, and then after that, you should see another NIC in the wireless section. This time, we're going to configure it as a client that connects to an existing wireless network. That way, you don't have to physically connect to the WAN port, we'll connect over wireless. We can do this by scanning and connecting to an existing wireless network, and after that, you'll have a completely functional router that can connect to a wireless network 
and share it with all of your clients. I should mention that even though this works fine, this USB NIC only supports 2.4 GHz or wireless N. This is generally fast enough for the internet connection, but just know you're going to be limited by the speed of this NIC, which is around 150 megabits at most. Personally, I would only use this option if you can't physically connect your WAN port to an upstream router. If you can physically connect to the WAN via Ethernet, what I would do is just disable this NIC, configure it to broadcast the same private network on 2.4 GHz, this way, you can set your primary NIC to 5 GHz. I had to do this to connect my WiseCam since it only supports 2.4 GHz. Yes, I take a WiseCam with me when I travel so that I can keep an eye on the place when I leave and also keep an eye on my two little pups, Buddy and Nano. Now that I have this all working, I can fire up my router and connect any of my devices to it and use my own secure wireless network. After running a speed test, you can see I'm getting anywhere from 180 to 200 megabits per second, which is pretty decent considering I have 500 up and down here at home. I'm sure I can squeeze out some more performance if I tweak the settings, but this is great considering everything is running on stock settings. So now that we have OpenWRT working with an upstream router, what happens if I don't have an upstream router at all? This is where the LTE modem that I mentioned earlier comes into play. This is great for times when you don't have an internet provider where you're staying, or you just decide to go live the van life. Someday. Installing the software on OpenWRT was pretty straightforward. Again, <laughs> you install a few packages, but then you reboot this time. But before I rebooted, I installed this cheap testing sim into my device. After rebooting, you'll then go to the network interfaces and add the new interface, which should be USB 0. You'll want to set this to WAN as the firewall zone and then save and apply. You can then access the modem's web GUI on a private IP address from a device connected to a LAN port. You should then see your device connected to your cellular provider and voila! This connection can be shared with anyone connected to the device. Oh, and I did update the firmware too because I love updating firmware. <laughs> Especially on Friday nights. Now that we have OpenWRT working as an access point, a firewall, and a router that can connect to an upstream router via Ethernet, wireless, or LTE, it was now time to focus on the home lab part of this. Since I installed Proxmox on the host, I can now install anything on this machine. The first thing I decided to install was Pi-hole to keep every connected device safe and free from ads and tracking. Like all installations of Proxmox, you have options of how you want to install things. I typically choose virtual machines, but I wanted to keep this lean and mean, so I went with an LXC container. LXC containers are easy to manage and use less resources than full VMs. So I created an LXC container and set the host name and the password and uploaded my public SSH key. I chose the Ubuntu template and then gave it eight gigs of disk space, two CPU cores, and two gigabytes of RAM. For networking, I connected it to the existing bridge, which is my LAN, and gave it a static IP address. Once the LXC container was created, I updated it and installed Pi-hole. After installing, I updated all of my ad lists. I also added about 5 million sites to my block list, and you can see that in a video up here somewhere. <laughs> I ended up enabling DHCP on Pi-hole just to see what it was all about. I usually let my router do this, but for this travel router, I wanted to have more control over blocking. So I ended up disabling DHCP on OpenWRT and enabling it on Pi-hole. Awesome. So now we have Pi-hole with network-wide ad blocking running, so what's next? Well, I know I want to have Docker as a platform for running applications on this mobile home lab device, and Portainer is the best way to manage them. I chose to create another LXC container based on Ubuntu. I gave it 60 gigabytes of hard drive, four CPU cores this time, and 16 gigabytes of RAM. I spun up the container, let it grab an IP, and then I reserved that IP inside of Pi-hole. Once the container was up and running, I updated Ubuntu and installed Portainer. Once Portainer was running, I then installed Watchtower to keep all of my containers up to date. Now, I typically use GitOps to handle this in my home production cluster, but I don't want to worry about updating containers while traveling. Installing Watchtower was easy. Just copy and paste the Docker Compose into Portainer and I was good to go. So now that I have Portainer installed, we can install any container we like and take it with us. For instance, we can install the super popular Jellyfin or Plex and take our media library with us. This would allow any connected device to stream movies from this device down to theirs 
without an internet connection. The nice thing about this Intel CPU is that it has quick sync, so you can hardware transcode videos if you need to, making sure that streaming is smooth on any resolution. I bet you're wondering about disk space. <laughs> well, if you really want to take more than one terabyte of media with you, you could simply connect and attach a USB hard drive with your media to this machine and mount the hard drive to your Plex or Jellyfin machine. That simple. And the fun does not stop there. No siree. <laughs> we can now install any Docker container or LXC container we like, or even a full-blown VM since we're running Proxmox. If we really wanted to, we can now install PFSense or OpenSense as a virtual machine and use that as a router and disable all the routing features on OpenWRT, really only using it as an access point. Then, once you have PFSense or OpenSense running, you can then create a VPN connection back home to get the same protection you have at home. Want to install other containers like Steam Cache, Nextcloud, or even a local Minecraft server? No problem. And the nice thing about a general purpose machine like this is you have unlimited possibilities. And by using the Intel Celeron platform, you get powerful hardware at a fraction of the power consumption, so you get the best of both worlds. And using a hardware platform and form factor like this, you get a Wi-Fi router and access point that connects all of your devices, internet or not, and lots of services that you can use while you're on the go. I'll be using this device full time when I travel, so I'll be sure to report back any modifications I make to this new mobile home lab forbidden router plus plus ultimate router home lab thingy. <laughs> yeah, it's complicated. I learned too much about OpenWRT, LTE connectivity, and all about how to build a mobile home lab, and I hope you learned something too. And remember, if you found anything in this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.